Turn with me to Exodus 6. Uh, this morning we pick up where we left off. Uh, we got through chapter 5 last week, and uh, we, we saw Moses and Aaron. Uh, they stood before Pharaoh, and they were just saying what God told them to say. Let my people go out into the wilderness for three days and worship the Lord. But Pharaoh mockingly, mockingly said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? Who, why would I let Israel go? And so in his anger and in his bitterness, Pharaoh says, They have too much time on their hands. Those Jews are lazy. They're idle. And so Pharaoh orders them to increase their workload in making bricks. As he tells them, now you have to supply your own straw to mix in with the clay to build the bricks. And so they're already being beaten down and, you know, worked, uh, you know, just savagely treated. And so the Jews are under this heavy, heavy burden. And so when they cry out to Pharaoh, the leaders of Israel, saying, you know, why are you doing this? You know, and they, he blames Moses. Oh, Moses, he wants you guys to just go out and worship your God. And so they're mad at Moses, and they go and yell at Moses, you know, what, this is your fault. You know, we're, we had it easier before you showed up. And so chapter 5 ends with Moses complaining to God. And it's like, Lord, why did you even send me here? I'm just doing what you told me to do, and now everybody's mad at me. So why am I here, Lord? If you're not going to save them, if you're not going to rescue them, what's the point? So Moses is upset. He's discouraged. Uh, he cries out to God, but now as we come into chapter 6, God is going to tell him once again what he's going to do. And this is truly a remarkable section of Scripture here in chapter 6, these first 13 verses. Um, God's going to reiterate the fact that he will fulfill everything that he has said he would do. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. And so God will deal very graciously with Moses. He reminds him that you know, God is in control, God is sovereign uh, over all things, and he will set his people free. This is a section where we're going to see these seven I wills of the Lord, and you know, he'll emphatically tell him, I will rescue my people, I will deliver my people, I will bring them into the promised land, I will do all these things for them. And so it's not really about the faithfulness of the Jewish people, who are not very faithful right now, nor is it about the faithfulness of Moses, who's really struggling in his faith, but it always boils down to the faithfulness of God to do what he says he's going to do. So as we go through these statements of God, we will discover that there are many spiritual applications for us as well. After all, God wants us to be set free from whatever bondage we are in. He wants to rescue you from whatever you've gotten yourself into. He wants to bring us into that promised land of a productive, fruitful life, walking in the power of the Holy Spirit and not in the weakness of our flesh. And so let's read the first five verses here in chapter 6 of Exodus. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. So Moses whining, complaining, you know, this is so horrible, this is so bad. And, you know, and uh, I brought up Bethany first service. And I know I shouldn't, my daughter, but, you know, she gets up there. After five minutes, she's grumbling and complaining. There's so many flies are biting me. It's like, okay, put some pants on, you know. That's it, you know. If that's the worst that you're facing in your life today, you got it pretty, you know, you're, you're good. So stop whining. So the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh, for with a strong hand he will let them go. And with a strong hand, he will drive them out of his land. And God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, Lord, I was not known to them. I have also established my covenant with them and to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage in which they were strangers. And I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. And so in response to Moses, you know, who's saying, why have you sent me? Nobody's listening to me. God reminds Moses, this is who I am. This is what I'm going to do. I made a promise to Abraham, then to Isaac, then to Jacob, and now you, Moses, shall see me fulfill my promise. 
you will see what I shall do to Pharaoh. In other words, God is reassuring Moses that in spite of the fact that you're feeling down, you're feeling discouraged, this changes nothing. Nothing's changed, Moses. Everything is right on schedule. Everything I've declared, everything I promised, is going to come to pass. So God is reminding Moses, my word is sure. What I said, I will do. And often we need to be reminded of the same things. Our God is not a wishy-washy God who changes his mind. He doesn't say, oops, I forgot about Jeff yesterday. Nope. He doesn't change. His word doesn't change. He does not change his mind about you. He loves you unconditionally. He wants to give you peace that surpasses all understanding. He wants to give you indescribable joy, inexpressible joy. What he's promised to you and me is fully guaranteed. And we all need to be reminded of the fact that his grace is sufficient. His salvation is a free gift. If you've stumbled... If you've been discouraged, if you feel uh, lonely or afraid, that changes nothing about God, changes nothing about his plans and purposes for you. What's going on back there? Am I hearing myself? Okay. Are you listening to some other pastor? <laughs> you got Jack Hibbs on there or what? <laughs> Sometimes in the security room, I'll go back there, and, and who's ever doing the security room, we got Jack Hibbs playing in the background. I think, oh, I understand. Okay. I'm not jealous. I don't care if he's got 20,000 people in his church. I don't know. He who's faithful in little, hopefully is faithful in much. So anyway, if you've gone through anything or you're going through something today, it doesn't change the fact that God is on the throne. He still loves you. He has a plan for your life. And so we need to get back into God's word. We need to listen to the Holy Spirit as he reminds us, he'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He's with you always, even to the end of this age. He is our fortress. He is our strong tower. He who began a good work in you will complete it till the day of Jesus Christ. He is on the throne. He's in control. As Jesus said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, like the Jewish people here, and I will give you rest. And so God reminds Moses in verse 1, now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. With a strong hand, he will let you go. With a strong hand, he will drive you out of this land. Moses, you're not going to have to you know, run away with your tail between your legs or sneak out a back door. You're going to be right there. You're going to see what I'm going to do as I let you guys go free. And God would provide for them. God would take care of them. And even that army that Moses would be fearful of, it's like God saying, I got it under control. Don't worry about that army. I'm going to drown them in the Red Sea. No problem, Moses. Just trust me. Keep your eyes on me. My words will come to pass. Now look at verses 2 and 3 once again. It says, And God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, Lord, or Yahweh, I was not known to them. The Lord revealed himself to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty. We know the term is El Shaddai. A uh, beautiful title for God, the, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the almighty one. That's how Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob knew him. Their relationship with God was personal, but less personal than what Moses will experience. Remember, as Moses has said, what is your name? And, and he says, I am who I am. Tell him I am has sent you to me. From that, we get the tetragrammaton, the you know, YHWH or Yahweh. The, the name of God. And in your Bible, it's probably capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, Lord. That's Yahweh in the, in the Hebrew. So even though Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob knew God, they didn't have that close personal relationship with God like Moses does. And I mentioned it before, Moses had more conversations with God than anybody else in the Bible. I mean, God spoke to him. And he had such a heart for wanting to know more of God. I just want to see you, Lord. Remember, and God will put him in the cleft of the rock and he'll pass by. And 
he goes, you can't see me face to face. You'll be vaporized, but you'll see the backside of me. And God reveals himself to, the, to Moses in a very personal, powerful way. Now, some of you had that kind of relationship like, you know, those that know about God. You have head knowledge of God. Uh, my view of God, I was never really an atheist, but, you know, I grew up thinking if there is a God out there, he's probably just waiting for me to step out of line. He's going to smack me upside the head with a baseball bat. I mean, that's just how I viewed God. He was angry at me and mean, and then I would, you know, sin. Oh, nothing happened. Sin a little bit more. Oh, I guess there is no God, you know, and you just don't understand that he is very personal. He's very patient. He loves us. And, and some of you were in open rebellion against God like I was, but you were aware of his existence. But it's when you come to Jesus and he saves you and, and you realize he's washed my sins away. His blood has cleansed me of all unrighteousness. I'm a new creation in Christ. All my old is gone. Everything's new. I have this loving relationship with the creator of the universe. It's amazing. He took upon himself as he hung on the cross all the punishment that I deserve for my sins. And so when we enter into that relationship with the Lord, we begin to grow in that personal intimacy with him. We didn't get to see him more and more through the word who he is and what he's done for us and we cry out abba father or papa daddy i mean that's the kind of relationship god wants to have with us that's why we cling to verses like this in hebrews 4 16 it says let us therefore come boldly that means confidently to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. In John 6, 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. And, and you know, there's hundreds and hundreds of verses like that. The Lord's just calling us, come to me and I'll give you rest. Whoever comes to me, I'll by no means cast you out. He wants us to draw closer to himself. And so God is telling Moses here, those patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they knew me as God Almighty, you know, the, the awesome God of creation. But now my people are going to understand me in a deeper way. Those men, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they knew me as the one who makes a promise. But Moses, you and the people are going to see that I am the God who fulfills those promises. And that's awesome. That is huge. And by the way, I believe we are in a special season of time like the Jews were in Moses' day when they will witness God keeping and fulfilling his promises. We're in a season where we're, I believe we're in the last days. And we're witnessing God bringing all things together in these days. And a, a whole bunch of biblical prophecies are about to be fulfilled, I believe, in rapid succession. And in the same way that the Jewish people at that time were feeling down and defeated at the hands of the Egyptians, many Christians are feeling that way today. They're just seeing the world crumbling around us. We're seeing our freedoms being eroded. We're just seeing more and more troubles in the world today. But God's word to Moses is about to be re you know, repeated very soon in our time. Now you will see what I'm you know, about to do. My strong arm is about to rise up again. And if you have any questions about what God is going to do in the near future, I encourage you, just read through the book of Revelation. Or you can you know, watch the, the series we just finished a couple of months ago. We went verse by verse through Revelation. And so it's just amazing what God is doing in the season in which we live. Well, look at verses 6 through 8. This is kind of the, the core of the message today. It says, Therefore... God speaking to Moses, Therefore say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage. And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. I will take you as my people and I will be your God. Then you shall know that I am the Lord, your God, who brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will bring you into the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
and I will give it to you as a heritage. I am the Lord. And so in these three verses here, we see the seven I will statements of God, what he is doing for the Jews at this time. Notice again, I will bring you out. I will rescue you. I will deliver you. I will bring you into the land. I will take you as my people. I'll give you a heritage, says the Lord. I am the Lord, he says. In other words, God is saying, I'm taking control. I'm stepping into this situation. This is what I'm going to do. Now, it's interesting because in the Hebrew language, every time when God says, I will do these things, I will do these things, every one of these is in the present tense. In other words, we read this like, oh yeah, God is about to do something in the future. When God says this, he's saying it in the present tense. When he says, I will do this, in God's way of thinking, it's already done. God's outside of time. So when he says, I make this promise to you, it's already fulfilled in his mind. He knows the end from the beginning. And, and that's where you can have that assurance. I know where I'm going when I die. Not because of anything I've done, but because of God's promises to be absent from this body, to be present with the Lord. I'm looking forward to that day when I go to be in the presence of the Lord. God's like, it's a done deal. And that's why he says, you can come into my throne room of grace at any time. It's fulfilled. And you just stand in, in the promises I've made because in God's mind, they're fulfilled already. God says he's going to do these things in the future, but it's a sure thing. You can be 100% confident that if I said it, God says, I'm going to fulfill it. It's already done. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. This, the, the same Seven I will statements. They can be applied to each and every one of us. It's, this is why Exodus is so awesome. And Paul says, these things were written for our admonition. These are examples written for us, Paul says. So we look at these Old Testament things 3,500 years ago, and we're like, I can still apply these to me today. And it's so true because each one of these seven I will statements from God, they're all in the New Testament. There's nothing new. You know, God says, I will to you this morning. And even if you don't see it yet, God says it's a done deal. I'll bring you out from the burdens of the Egyptians. Well, Egypt represents the world in the Bible. So he's saying, I'll bring you out from the burden of this world. God has brought us out of the burdens and the wickedness of this dying world. He says, I will redeem you here. Well, he's redeemed us by the blood of Jesus. Look at these verses in Colossians 1, starting in verse 13. Paul says, He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us or transferred us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. That's where we are right now, in His kingdom. You're thinking, I'm in a stupid old building here in North or, you know, off of North Avenue. No, we are citizens of heaven first and foremost. So I'm transferred you into the kingdom of the Son of His love in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sin. So even as God says here, I will redeem you. He's already said, I have redeemed you through Jesus Christ. Here God says, I will rescue you. First Thessalonians chapter 1, Paul commends the Thessalonians because it says they turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. And then he says in 1 Thessalonians 1.10 on the screen, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. So we're not going to go through God's wrath. He's already delivered us from his wrath because Jesus took the wrath that we deserve upon himself when he hung on the cross, crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's why Hebrews 13, 5 says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you because you're in Christ. Christ took the wrath that we deserve upon himself. So if you say, I don't want to be in Christ, I want to go through this on my own, then you will face the wrath of God, unfortunately. Here God says to the Jewish people, I will take you as my people and I will be your God. That just speaks of adoption. God has adopted us into his family. John chapter 1, verse 12 it says, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. Again, all these I will statements of God, we find fulfilled in the New Testament. Philippians 3.20 
says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will, he will, he'll do it. He'll transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body. So, me, my lowly body. Well, look in the mirror. Or pull out a picture from your high school yearbook. And then look in the mirror. <laughs> yeah, our bodies are getting older. They're wearing out. We're not getting better. Maybe spiritually, hopefully you're getting stronger, but we'll talk about that later. Though the outward man is perishing, the inner man is being renewed. But be that as it may, he says that we're going to be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. In fact, you can find all these I will statements fulfilled in Ephesians chapters 1, 2, and 3. I mean, all over the place we find God saying to us, I will do this, and I have done this in your life. Now, I'll say one more thing about the I will statements. There's somebody else in the Bible that had some I will statements. You remember who that was? Lucifer. Lucifer had five I wills, and um, we see the lie of Lucifer in this I will statement. Uh, look at these verses. It's in Isaiah chapter, or, yeah, Isaiah 14, starting in verse 12. It says of Lucifer, How you have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. This is talking about when he got kicked out of heaven. Why? How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. And this is the reason why. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. And here is what is known as the lie of Satan. I will be like the most high. That's exactly what he said to Adam and Eve in the garden. You're not going to die. You'll be just like God. That's the lie. Paul says that's the lie in Romans chapter 1. The devolution of man, instead of worshiping the one true creator, man starts worshiping creation. The lie is you don't need God. You are a God or you can become a God. Or like the Mormons say, you know, as God, man is, God once was. As God is, man may become. That's the lie. Paul talks about that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the lie. And it refers to that fact that I will be like the Most High. I can do it on my own. And here's God's response to Lucifer's five I wills. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. When does that take place? Revelation 20, verses 1 through 4 or 5. That's where we see when Jesus returns, the Antichrist, the false prophet, are thrown in the lake of fire that burns forever and ever. Satan is taken and thrown into the bottomless pit, the lowest depths of the pit. And he's locked up for a thousand years. That's the millennial reign of Christ. And then eventually he'll end up in the lake of fire as well. But all of Satan's I wills come forth from a heart of pride and arrogance. So we've got God saying, I will. We've got Satan saying, I will. Well, you can take a guess on who wins that, that battle. Obviously, the Lord wins that battle. So whose word is going to prevail? God's word. Who is speaking with absolute power and authority? The Lord is. And so for us, the real question is, whose words are we listening to? The word of God or the words of the enemy, his lies? The words of God, you know, brings life, peace, joy, truth, assurance. But Satan's words bring bondage and fear and doubt, and confusion. Again, whose words are you listening to? Let me just say it another way. Whose words are speaking the loudest today in our world? Well, Satan's lies are everywhere. Flip on the TV. Watch any news channel. Flip on your radio. You're going to hear lie after lie. Your iPad, your phone, you're going to get lies thrown at you constantly. Our government, a lot of lies coming out of our government coming out of the halls of our schools, even in our libraries. Satan is lying to everyone. Satan's got people marching throughout the streets now in Paris, burning and, you know, cars, burning up buildings, all in the name of peaceful protesting. What a lie. But God wants to, wants to speak to us through his word, 
That's how we hear his still small voice. And like never before, we need to have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to us from his word. I'm getting sick and tired of listening to what the enemy says he's going to do, but I never get tired of what God says and what he's got planned for my life now, what he's got planned for my life in the future, and what he's got planned for his bride. Now, that doesn't mean we stick our heads in the sand and ignore what's going on in the world around us, but because we are overcomers in Christ, we can pray for those around us. We can proclaim the gospel. It doesn't matter if you have freedom or not. We're still mandated to proclaim the gospel to everyone in our nation. Right now, we still have a voice with our votes. I guess, I hope. So step out in faith, see what God wants to do. In fact, the very same ministry that Jesus was given by the Father, which was done in the power of the Holy Spirit, he's given to you and me. And I love how you know Jesus takes the scroll of Isaiah. This is in Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. He opens it up in Isaiah, finds where it's, you know, he quotes himself out of the Old Testament. That's pretty cool. And this is what Jesus says. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Well, the Spirit of the Lord needs to be upon us. That's what Acts 1.8 will tell us. Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. You, you've been anointed with the Holy Spirit to preach the gospel to the poor in spirit, those that need to know. Jesus loves them. Jesus died for them. They're sinners, and without Christ, they're destined for hell, but God wants to rescue them, deliver them. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Now, I can't heal anybody, but as we give them the good news of Jesus... Jesus can certainly heal their broken hearts, proclaim liberty to the captives. You don't have to be in bondage to that anymore, whatever it might be. We can let them know there's hope in Jesus. There's life in Jesus. There's forgiveness in Christ. There's restoration, healing in Jesus. Uh, recovery of sight to the blind. Again, through the word of God, people's eyes can be opened up to see their need for Christ and his love for them. To set at liberty those who are oppressed. Yeah, we're seeing people around us, so many that are oppressed, depressed, discouraged, bummed out, but we have the answer in Christ to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And that's only possible as we deny ourselves, we take up our cross daily, we follow Jesus. After all, it's not us doing the work, the work of God, but it's allowing the Holy Spirit of God to work in us and through us, and then he gets all the glory. We're just little clay pots that God uses. He enables us to minister to others in the way that Jesus ministers to us. So God has given Moses his word. Uh, he's given them his promises that he will deliver the Israelites from their bondage, their slavery, from the oppression of the Egyptians. He's given them the promise he'll bring them into the land of Israel, the land that he promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And now with the word of God in his heart, with this assurance on his mind from the Lord, this is what you're going to do and this is what I'm going to do, Moses. Just go in and tell him. Moses is all pumped up. He's excited, ready to go. But watch how quickly Moses will be discouraged once again. Look at verse 9. So Moses spoke thus to the children of Israel. That's what God says. I will, I will, I will. Yay! But they did not heed Moses because of anguish of spirit and cruel bondage. So he goes there excitedly telling them what God is going to do, how God's going to set them free. But they did not heed Moses. And it tells us the reason is because of anguish of spirit because of their cruel bondage. That phrase, anguish of spirit, literally means out of breath. Have you ever been so down and discouraged and just so, uh, you're just out of breath. You can't even take another step. You can't even get, you can hardly get out of bed the next morning. That's how beat up and, and how downcast these people are because of their cruel bondage. That's what Satan wants to do to all of us. Steal, kill, and destroy whatever God's wanting to do. And, and you can get us so down and discouraged. I don't want to get out of bed. Well, Jeff, you got to get out of bed. It's Sunday morning. <laughs> no, God, he stirs us up. 
the Jewish people are literally out of breath because of how harshly they've been treated by the Egyptians. So Moses' good news, it just falls in deaf ears. I'm sure you've all experienced that. I know I have, where you're so excited to tell this friend, this neighbor. I mean, when I first got saved, I was telling all my friends about Jesus. And most of them just like, you're nuts. I don't want to hear it. And so many so-called friends that I was teammates with at San Diego State said, I don't want to even talk to you anymore. I mean, it was sad. I mean, you're all excited, but it falls on deaf ears. And then, you know, but I know how it is because I was those, one of those guys when the Christians on our team would tell me about Jesus, I started cussing them out. Get away from me, you Jesus freak. I don't want to hear this. This is my best life now. <laughs> God has a way of saying, no, it's not. Be that as it may, we've all talked to people who are, you know, they've lost all hope. They see no way out. We tell them about Jesus, who he is, all that he's done for us, going to the cross, shedding his blood for our sins, that he loves them. He wants to save them and set them free. But our words just fall off you know, fall onto deaf ears. That can be discouraging, but that is also when you come to realize, I can't save anybody. I can't change anybody's heart. I can't convince anybody that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, but I'm just a clay pot. I'm a vessel. I'm just the messenger. I just, you know, God's given us his word. We just tell others what the word says. And you'll get rejected. I mean, all the seeds that were planted in the parable of the sower, only one brought good fruit, found good soil, produced an abundance. Three out of four didn't cut it. But that's also when we realize only God can change a sinful heart. Only God can set people free. Again, if I just de deliver the message of truth and love and hope and salvation, then God can do what he needs to do. And that's what Moses is slowly but surely learning through this process. He, he, he thinks, I got to do this, and God's showing him, Moses, you can't. Not on your own. I will do it. You just be the vessel. You just tell them what I want, to, I want you to tell them. And so Moses is down again. He's discouraged again. And so we read in verse 10, God's not going to let him off the hook so easily. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, go in. Tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the children of Israel go out of his land. Again, he gives them his marching orders. It's like the third time he tells them what he's supposed to say. Go in. Tell Pharaoh. Let the people go. That's all you got to do. Just speak those words, and then I will do what I need to do. But Moses is still struggling with the calling that God has placed on his life. So, verse 12 and Moses spoke before the Lord, saying, The children of Israel have not heeded me. How then shall Pharaoh heed me? For I am of uncircumcised lips. Again, it just means I don't talk so good. Acts 7 tells us, no, he was well spoken, well educated. Just an excuse. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron and gave them a command for the children of Israel and for Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. And so once again, Moses is still focused on his own limitations. He's focused on his own shortcomings. Instead of focusing on the Lord and God's unlimited resources. And so Moses is still hung up on, you know, who am I? I'm a nobody. I can't do nothing right. Look at my past. Look at all the mistakes I've made. Look at my failures. you got to pick somebody else, Lord. Now, all that discouragement and anguish that all the Israelites and Moses felt, it's nothing new. It's still around today. People everywhere are in despair. They're lacking peace. They have no joy. There's little hope. When we look at the condition of the world around us, it's easy to, easy to get discouraged. I mean, look at Russia and Ukraine. Why? NATO's like, we got to start backing up Ukraine. Let's escalate this a little bit more. We're sending over those cluster bombs that a few years ago we said, that's illegal to use against people. That stuff will, you know, that, that's cruel. Now we're sending them stuff. 
It's just going to escalate because we're in the last days and it's supposed to escalate. You look at Israel and all the nations around them that hate Israel and things are ramping up there. Iran is still saying, we're going to wipe out all the Jews. We're going to drive them into the Mediterranean Sea. We soon realize the clock is ticking. Time is getting short. The enemy is doing all that he can to steal, kill, and destroy the people on planet Earth. And when we see all the corruption in our own government, we see all the global entities wanting to have a one world cashless society. We're, we're seeing inflation, rising economies, moving toward a worldwide banking system. Uh, when we see all the signs of the end times quickly coming together, it's time that we stop looking around and getting all flustered and mad and upset watching the news. We need to look up. You know, the Bible is very clear. Jesus is very, uh, one of my favorite verses, Luke 21, 28. Jesus says, now when these things begin to happen, right? Look up, lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. Listen, if we just keep looking down and looking around, it's easy to get discouraged. It's easy to get bummed out and frustrated and angry. It'll keep you from getting stirred up to minister to others, to speak out about Jesus, proclaiming the truth of God's word. But if we look up, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these other things will be added unto us. But look up. I mean, remember how this started with Moses, 40 years old, He's a prince of Egypt. He sees an Egyptian killing a fellow Jew, so he kills the Egyptian. This is 40 years earlier. And so he has to flee for the next 40 years. But what did we read there? It says Moses, when he sees the, the Hebrew being beaten up by this Egyptian, it says he looked this way, and then he looked that way, and then he struck down the Egyptian. What was his mistake? He didn't look up. We always need to look up first. Colossians 3 Verses 1 through 4, Paul reminds us, If then you were raised with Christ, again, it's a done deal. You're a new creation in Christ. You've been raised up with him. Seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory and so when you look up and seek the lord that's when he'll tell you what to look at look around what's the name of that new movie that's out freedom the sound of freedom i encourage you to see it i haven't seen it yet but i've, I've looked at a lot of interviews and watched a lot of things i mean it's powerful and i encourage you because you know we don't just look up and like oh we're just gonna look up Ignore all the garbage and stuff and the lost people around us. No, we look up to the Lord. Then he gives us our marching orders, and it'll be different for every one of us. He'll have you go over here and minister this way, over here, minister that person, whatever he has for you. But you got to seek first the Lord and what he has for you. And it's only when we have that proper focus on Jesus that we can then have a proper focus on how we are to look at this fallen, sinful world around us. And that's how we rightly engage with the culture around us. Too many churches, unfortunately, are wanting to let the culture influence the church. And that's where we're seeing so many churches failing because they want to be so culturally relevant, they're not being godly relevant. They're not seeking Jesus. They're just wanting the world to be, you know, accepting them. It's like, no. We're to be influencing the culture around us. But when the culture influences us, then I'll put on a dress and some lipstick and a wig. Are you kidding me? That's not what the church needs. That's not God's will. That's not his word. No, he wants us to be the people of God representing Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world, not become so culturally relevant that all they see, oh, that church is just like us living out our sinful fantasies, living out our pagan beliefs. That's what happened in the third century when after Constantine died, they made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. Sounds good on paper. Six million 
Christians were put to death, martyred in the first 250 years of the church. So now they make the church the official religion. Christianity, the official religion of the Roman Empire. That's when things went downhill. Because then they said, oh, all the pagans can just bring in all their idols. And instead of worshiping Horus and Isis, we'll just exchange Mary and baby Jesus. We'll just worship them. I mean, that's where it all started. Because they started allowing the culture to come in the church and change it from the inside out. And that's when things got pretty bad. Again, we talked about all those things when we went through the churches there in Revelation 2 and 3. It's only when we have a proper focus on Christ do we have the proper focus on the world around us. Again, we are in a spiritual battle. This is why we have to look up and see Jesus and get in his word, hear his voice. That is where our power comes from, the word of God and the Holy Spirit of God. That is where our purity will come from. So we don't be like the world. We don't want to be like the world. That is how we get the proper perspective so we can successfully navigate into this world. So look up and hear God say, I will, instead of listening to Satan, say, no, no, you can do this. I will, Satan says, or God says, I will. Make sure you're listening to the Lord. Now, I believe that Jesus is coming for his bride very soon. And Jesus has many I will statements as well. One of my favorite is found in John 14, starting in verse 1, where he tells his troubled, discouraged disciples, Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will. I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So again, listen to the Lord's I will statements. He is coming back for you. He's coming back for me, and he will take us home to be with him in heaven. Again, that's where the power comes from. Power, purity, proper perspective. Real quickly, and this will all end with these things. The power. Remember the, the ten virgins that Jesus gives us the parable? They're waiting for the bridegroom. Five were wise, five were foolish. Why were the five wise? Because they had oil. What's the oil represent? The Holy Spirit. Where does our power come from? The Holy Spirit. Jesus says in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be, you shall be witnesses to me. In Jerusalem, that's Grand Junction for us, Jerusalem. Judea, Colorado, Samaria, United States, to the end of the earth. Kind of where Emily is right now. The end of the earth. You go Grand Junction, go across the globe, there's where Emily is. I've been there four times. You can't get any farther to the uttermost parts of the world than that from our perspective. So there's power from the Lord as we look up to the Lord. There's also a purity that comes from the Lord as we look up to the Lord as we know that he's coming back at any time, as we wait for the trumpet to sound. We just saw this in our men's study on Tuesday morning, 1 John 3, verses 2 and 3. The Apostle John says, Beloved, now we are children of God. It has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him, in Christ, that you're going to see him, you're going to have a new resurrection body, will be like him, purifies himself just as he is pure. And so that hope of seeing Jesus face to face, that hope of being caught up into his presence at any moment, should have a, a wonderful purifying effect on how we live our lives. My hope is not in this world getting better. My, my hope is not in our political leaders. My hope is not thinking that, oh, this world's going to figure everything out. No, my hope is in Jesus. That's where all of our hope needs to be. There's a purity that comes. And it comes quite naturally when you know Jesus is coming for you at any moment. The imminent return of Christ. He can come for you at any moment. At the rapture, I hope for all of us. But the proverbial, you might get hit by a Mack truck today. At any moment... You don't know your day, you don't know your hour, you don't know your moment that you're leaving that body. 
but God does. Make sure you have that purifying effect. Of, today could be the day. I don't need to be walking in sin. I don't need to be compromising with this world or my flesh. I don't have time to be a lukewarm Christian. I need the power of the Holy Spirit to purify my heart and mind. That's how we should be living, and that will always give us a proper perspective as we navigate this fallen world. This world, our lives, temporary, right? Don't think, oh man, I'm going to be 100 years old. Like, So what is 100 years in comparison to eternity? I grew up in San Diego. I surfed a lot. You take one drop of water, that's your life. Drop it in the Pacific Ocean. That's our 100 years compared to eternity. Not much. James says we're, we're a vapor here today, gone tomorrow. So how are you living your life? For the things of eternity or just for the things of this world? We should be storing up our treasures in heaven, Jesus says. Not here on earth. He says on earth, moth, rust, destroys, thieves, break in and steal. Store up your treasures in heaven. Wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart will be also. Final verses. Look at 2 Corinthians 4. Starting in verse 16. Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing. Yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. Again, this fleshly body is wearing out. It's getting older. Eventually, it's going to drop dead unless the rapture takes place. Yet the inward man, our spiritual nature, that should be growing stronger all the time as we spend time in God's word, in prayer, in fellowship with one another, stirring each other up, holding each other accountable. So even though the outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. And I love the Apostle Paul for saying, verse 17, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. And I look at that and think, what do you mean light affliction, Paul? Read a few chapters later in chapter 11 of 2 Corinthians. Beaten with rods five times. Three shipwrecks where he's swimming out in the deep. Stoned and left for dead. Thrown into prisons just for telling people about Jesus. Light afflictions. And here we are up at Uncompagre during our camp. And I won't use her name again. <laughs> oh, the bugs are biting my ankle. Put some pants on. And I woke up today and it's like, man, I got five bites on my ankle too. That's, that stinks. Didn't even know they were out there. But be that as it may, it's light affliction in comparison to the eternal weight of glory that God's got in store for us. Verse 18, while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are are eternal. We don't need to be down and discouraged like Moses was, but as we look to Jesus, he gives us that proper understanding of the world around us because we're walking in the power of the Spirit. We're living out our Christian lives in purity, seeking first the kingdom of God, and then we see the world around us that is desperate in need of truth. And the truth comes from the Word of God. Jesus said, Father, sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the life. Is there absolute truth in this world? Absolutely. In Jesus, in the word of God. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. This world says, no, truth is relative, and they make things up as they go. And that's why you see so much confusion, so much heartache, so much disturbance, so much unrest. But it always comes back to how is your personal relationship with Christ today? Are you spending time in his word, in prayer, stirring each other up to love and good works? That's why we come together. That's why you spend time with other Christians outside these four walls. That's why I commend you. Continue to seek the Lord. Continue to say, here I am, Jesus. Use me. And he does in so many wonderful ways. Mm -hmm.